I'd like to welcome everyone today to our first Zoom program, How to Cultivate an Organic Lawn. This program is sponsored by the Sandy Spring Museum Garden Club. And as Laura said, my name is Amy Cohen and I'm one of the co-presidents. I'd also like to introduce Marilyn Kessinger, our other co-president. Hi, welcome, glad you could make it. Our mission is to support the museum's gardens and grounds. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the beautiful courtyard that our members maintain. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to look the next time you're at the museum. We are sponsoring two more programs this year. On October 11th is the Spring Bulbs program in which we will learn about selecting, planting, and maintaining spring bulbs. Fall is the perfect time for planting. November 8th is the holiday decor at Cherry Grove. This program will be a virtual tour of holiday decorations at the historic Cherry Grove with tips on how to construct some of the decorations. Although the house is 18th century, the decorations are definitely the style of Victorians. Let no surface go untouched. It's easy to become a member of the Garden Club. All you have to do is join the museum and let them know that you would like to join the Garden Club. Now I'd like to introduce Stephanie Parkhurst, who is a member of our program committee. Stephanie? Oh, good afternoon. I'm so glad that um, we have so many people here today. I hope you're enjoying the start of fall. Um, I want to uh, introduce Mary Tab Tabellini. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about how to cultivate an organic lawn. Um, Mary is the manager of the Organic Lawn and Landscape Program in the Montgomery County Department of Environment, excuse me, Department of Environmental Protection. And I do want to mention, um, please put your questions in the chat box. Um, we'll get to some during Mary's presentation. Um, but we will also have time at the end for you to um, get your questions answered. So, Mary, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much and uh, enjoy the program. Excellent. Thank you, everyone, for taking time on a, a middle of a Sunday day when it's beautiful weather and you might rather be outside. Uh, to come inside and, and listen to this presentation. Typically when I do this, I've got a captive audience in a room. I realize it's a little different on Zoom, so I can't you know, gauge your reactions in it. But again, if you have questions during the meeting that come up right then, feel free to put them in the chat. If I don't get to them then, I can get to them at the end. But Stephanie will interrupt me if it seems like there's something along the way that, that's really pertinent. I will give you Folks, a head up, heads up, I was asked to give my longer version of this presentation, which means that I'm going to be talking a little bit more about soils and soil biology. I'm going to take you back to high school biology and chemistry a little bit with some of the things I'm talking about. But I feel like it's important for people to really understand what's going on in the ground and how complex that is. That lawn care is not an easy fix. It's not something that comes out of a bag uh, that you just put something down and, and it's a miracle and you've got a great lawn. So so for some people, they have naturally great lawns. For some people, they struggle and everything in between. So I'm going to be covering a lot of information about that as we go along. Um, with that said, again, I'm from the Montgomery County Department of Environmental Protection. So I work for a county agency. You're welcome to contact me. My information will be at the end and I'll also type it in the chat box at the end as well uh, for folks if you want to contact me with further questions. And our website is there as well. We have a very extensive website on organic lawn care tips and tricks and nutrients and how to read your soil test. So everything that I go over today, if you feel like I've gone too fast, it's because I went too fast. But there's a lot of information in our website that almost everything I've said or will say should be there in some form that you should be able to understand and dive back in. Uh, if you don't have access, I figure everybody on this today has access to the web. If you don't have access to something, we can get you that information in print form. Or if you want us to get it to someone else, we're happy to print things out for you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, stop my video and I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to pull up my presentation here. Let's see, share. Give me a second. 
and then screen share. Now, if you're looking at your screen and you do have uh, images of people on the side, at the top of that, there's a little skinny bar that you can hit that says hide thumbnail video and it will make that go away. And that way you can see everything that is on my screen without it being blocked. All right, so one of the reasons that we go around sharing this information with folks is not only do people care about having a nice lawn, but we also have a new law with it in Montgomery County. And uh, we have had a pesticide law since the 80s in Montgomery County, but recently it was changed. And the change is rather significant. We're the first county, or we're the first major municipality in the United States to have a law of this scale. And what the law has done is it's banned the use of most synthetic pesticides on lawns playgrounds, mulch recreation areas, and private childcare facilities. This is most significant in the lawn arena because we have a lot of lawns, and this applies to every lawn in the county, uh, both to property owners and contractors. No one is exempt from the law. It applies to county lands as well, um, applies to private schools, all private properties, all businesses, and it doesn't matter if a, an individual or a company wants to apply something, this ban is in effect. I'm not gonna dive in too much on this, you can get a lot of information on, law, on this law, but it, it's changed a lot for people who are especially reliant on weed and feeds uh, and the pre-emergent herbicides that are put down to prevent things like crabgrass and other things within the lawn. And then it also prevents people from using things like the 2,4-D products and uh, glyphosate products and other things that they might use uh, within lawns or playgrounds. Why does this matter? Why is this so significant in Montgomery County and how much impact does it have? 14% of our county is covered by impervious surfaces. That's all of our roadways, our buildings, our parking lots, anything that water cannot get back in the ground, all of our developed areas. But at the same time, for all of the uh, inputs that we have to try to mitigate the effects of our impervious surfaces in the environment, 28% of our county lands are covered by turf grass. And we don't really think about that, but it's a huge source for pollutants, particularly pesticides within our waterways. And that's why uh, fertilizers and pesticides, we really wanna focus on what can people do to make sure that they're being as organic as possible. So when I give this talk, I don't talk just about pesticides. I'm really talking about all of the nutrients that go into our lawns, because really we can do organic lawn care without the use of anything synthetic. We've been doing it for generations before we had the advent of pesticides after World War II. Uh, so it's really doable. It just requires a little bit of understanding and we really have to get down to a little bit of the science. Why are organic lawns beneficial and what benefits could they provide to you and your environment? So I talk about this in um, contrast to native grasslands. Our native grasslands across the world store 50% more carbon per year than forest per acre. So we really wanna deepen our lawn roots and try to get them to mimic natural grasslands as much as we possibly can. The reason that grasslands store more carbon in the ground is because about 30% of their above ground and below ground vegetation that dies stays in the ground in some form of carbon. Whereas trees will actually recycle it back up to grow new leaves and, and put it back in. And, and trees do store a lot of carbon, but native grasslands actually exude liquid carbon back into the soil and store it there. That's really important. Um, our lawns uh, can improve air quality. Here in Maryland, our lawns trap 12 million pounds of airborne dust annually, and that is rather significant. Those 12, um, and they're doing that year round. Whereas again, I would never tell anybody, oh, chop down the forest and put down lawns. But we have a lot of suburban and urban areas where lawns are part of the environment, but year round they have those 3D dimensional leaves that are above ground capturing dust. Whereas our trees can only do that when they have leaves on them. So think about that through the winter that these lawns are actually Actually providing that benefit. Grasslands can produce three and a half times more oxygen than trees per acre and that's why we want to get our lawns to be nice and dense and to have the longest blades that they possibly can have. When we have good soils they can actually capture and infiltrate stormwater in urban environments and of course in urban environments they provide major erosion control. This is just a teaser. I just want you to know that I am going to eventually get to the top 10 tips for organic lawn care after I beat you down with some information about uh, biology and soil amendments. 
So let's launch into understanding soil biology. And again, I mentioned I'm going to take you back to some high school biology, some high school chemistry. It's going to be fast and dirty, but just to give you an impression of what we're talking about when, we're start, when we start messing with things that are in the soil. One of the most important things is understanding that soil organisms are the most important way that our plants survive. We cannot get any nutrients into the form that a plant can, can uptake unless we have soil organisms or unless we synthesize them from a bag. This is one of the reasons why fertilizers from a bag are not great because you're literally just feeding the plant, you're not feeding the soil. And if the plant is not ready to uptake it, that stuff will just wash off into our waterways. Uh, what soil organisms do is a lot of things. They'll decompose all the organic matter that are down there. They'll, they'll create carbon, steady, uh, stable carbon in the soil. They actually bind the soil with the glue-like secretions they put out. So our soil would just fall apart if we didn't have soil organisms creating these natural glues. We increase soil moisture. They immobilize nutrients in ways so that they can't wash out into our waterways. They are the things that convert nutrients into the form that, that a plant can uptake. So most of the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, minerals, and so on, the plant cannot uptake it unless an organism converts it into the form that can be absorbed by roots. They actually will prevent uh, diseases because they want to protect their host. Um, and they actually will replicate bacteria through grazing uh, throughout the, uh, the soil under there. Most of these or soil organisms we can't see. They're under the microscope. There are some that are slightly larger, but most of these are bacteria, protozoa, and uh, nematodes, and so on. Within the soil, we have what's called the cation exchange capacity, and I'll talk a little bit later about how to read a soil test, but the cation exchange capacity is explaining how the nutrients are bound to the soil. When you look at this little picture that's here, you see all those positive and negative bars there, and then you see what these, um, these little structures, those are the clay that are within the soil. And you can see on the clay all these little negative charges. So clay has a negative charge. Uh, sand and silt within your soil have no charge, so they can't hold any nutrients. But clay is actually really important. A lot of people say, oh, I have all these crappy clay, so clay soil, nothing's good. The clay is actually really important, but it also means we still need a lot of organic material. So clay has this negative charge, but most plant nutrients are positively charged and they will bind to the clay. So we need those clay particles in there to hold on and grab to and essentially stick to these plant nutrients. Negatively charged nutrients, which are also important, will generally bind to organic matter, which is why organic matter is also important in our soil. But again, many plant nutrients are in the positive form uh, until they're converted by microorganisms uh, into what a plant can uptake. When we look at this cation exchange, we've got a lot of things. So what are these nutrients? We've got aluminum, calcium, magnesium, et cetera. You can see it in the chart there. And what we have is called a hierarchy of affinity. So the smaller the particle, the more tightly it's held to the soil. And the higher the number of charges, the more tightly it's held. So if you look at those, um, that hierarchy there, you can see hydrogens at the top. It only has one charge, but hydrogen is extremely small. So it binds really tightly to the soil. But then aluminum, which is rather large, it has three charges. So it's just there right under hydrogen in terms of binding to the soil. If you see that little exchange down at the bottom, if you look at the image, you see all those little negative charges, that's on the soil colloid, which is on the, on the clay. And you can see these little nutrients that are bound to them. So like the calcium has two positive charges, it's gonna take up two negative charges on the soil. Uh, aluminum's got three, takes up three spaces. But they're constantly moving on and off of those soil colloids, particularly as microorganisms and weather changes what's happening in the soil and what's moving around. So if something comes off with two charges, then something like um, you know, potassium that has one, you would need two of those to replace it, for example. Or if aluminum needs to get on, it needs three of those spaces to get on there. But those are constantly moving back and forth in solution in the soil. And this is important for you to understand because when you put something, particularly something synthetic on the ground, you start creating a seesaw of what's coming off and what's going on. And you have no idea what you're doing. Even when you get a general like, oh, this is gonna put calcium in your soil, you just really don't know what you're messing with. We also have what are called anions. Anions are the negatively charged 
uh, particles. They cannot fix to clay because clay is also negatively charged. So they can only fix to organic matter, which is mostly positively charged, or they can be fixed into things like rocks, like permanently fixed into rocks. Uh, so phosphate and nitrate, which you see on the chart there, they're very important nutrients to plant and available to plants, but they easily wash out if they're not taken up immediately by the plant. So this um, is why people will buy phosphate in a bag and put it on their soil, but if the plant's not ready for it, it's not going to take it up and it's going to wash off into our waterways. Whereas micro, microorganisms will actually convert things into the phosphate and nitrate form that plants need. So the, again, microorganisms and having a living soil is extremely important. Then I always talk briefly about pH. Uh, and I, if we were in a room, I'd say, how many people have heard about you're supposed to sweeten the soil or change your pH? Uh, and we have to remind people, or I say we, I say me, that hydrogen is not a nutrient. So pH measures how much hydrogen is fixed in the soil. But when hydrogen is not a nutrient, we don't need to be messing with nutrients. So a low pH of four, that means that the soil has, is fully saturated with hydrogen. It means that no other nutrients can be stuck on those soil colloids because all we have is those positively charged hydrogen is bound to the soil. A high pH is mean that is that we have no hydrogen, but all the nutrients are now stuck to the soil and not available for plants. So a lot of, um, a lot of things grow within the range of four to seven, but at four, it's pretty extreme. At seven, it's pretty extreme. And most things don't grow under those conditions. So when people look at pH, I like to tell them, do not mess with your pH unless you simply cannot get grass to grow in that area. If you can get grass to grow, but it's struggling and your pH is a little off, don't worry about the pH because I mentioned before about that cation exchange. When we have hydrogen bound to there and then we try to raise the pH, we take calcium from a bag, we try to raise the pH, we knock off all that really tightly held hydrogen. So we're, we're throwing something out from a bag in and when it's knocking off all that tightly held hydrogen, it's also knocking off a lot of more important nutrients like magnesium, manganese and other things. And they're washing off in the streams and you're just causing a seesaw going back and forth where you just have this thing bouncing back and forth and you bought something from a bag, but it's not a permanent fix. So I usually tell people, do not mess with your pH unless you simply cannot get grass to grow there because the pH is like really on an extreme end. And why is this? Uh, another reason that it's important for pH and nutrient availability is you look at these two charts on the left. The chart you see on the left, you can see that I've circled 6.5 to 7. This is where most folks will say, if you Google anywhere or read any book, that lawns like to have a pH between six and a half to seven. And when you look at that chart there, you can see the width of those bars where it says nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera. You see how wide it is. And at six and a half to seven, those nutrients are more available. But if you see above that, I said that's in a soil with a high mineral content. If you look at the soil on the right with a high organic content, you'll see those bars are actually wider at a lower pH of five and a half. So you, if you don't really understand how much organic material you have in your soil, the more organic you get, the better plants will thrive at the lower pH. Um, and I put a little thing at the bottom. What do blueberries want? Do they want a low pH or do they actually want high nutrients? Again, I mentioned hydrogen is not a nutrient. They want high nutrients and at a low pH, they can access more limited nutrients and, and the blueberries, their native soils are highly organic. So you can see they're highly organic, more available nutrients at a lower pH. So it's not about the pH, it's about the soil. All right, so how do we get soil nutrients high for our grass? I'm gonna go through a bunch of the top nutrients that grass need, and then I'm gonna talk about some of the minor things, and I'm also gonna talk about how we feed our soil. So um, I'm gonna say, well, how many people have heard of NPK? Many of you who might've worked in gardens or have bought things from a bag, you'll see these percentages of NPK. The NPK is nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. Those are the three top nutrients that lawns need. Lawns are nitrogen hogs. They 
they take a lot of nitrogen, but we can get most of the nitrogen back that we need simply by leaving all the grass clippings on the lawn and chopping up any of the leaves that we can that fall on the lawn. So grass clippings can return between 50 to 100% of the nitrogen that a lawn needs and then leaves will return even more. So highly recommend that you keep your lawn mower going long past the time when you would be mowing your lawn and chop up those leaves into the smallest size possible. Leave as many on the lawn as possible. When you chop them up really small, the bacteria break them down faster, they'll disappear a lot faster and they won't mat up on your lawn. So always use leave your grass clippings, always leave as many leaves as possible. There's also other sources of nitrogen. Uh, earthworm castings are a fantastic source as are compost. Um, corn gluten, soybean meal, and alfalfa meal are great sources of nitrogen, but they're very hard to get in non-GMO form. So folks who are really trying to stick to an organic diet on their lawns uh, might eliminate this. If you live near the ocean, seaweed is a great source, and also coffee grounds are fantastic. So I always tell people, why are you tossing your coffee grounds in, you know, in the trash? Either put them in the compost or just let them dry out a little bit in a, in a bowl or something and then scatter them across the lawn whenever you're, you know, convenient to get out there. Uh, clover is a great way to get some nutrients back into your lawn. They actually contain the bacteria that fix nitrogen from the atmosphere into the soil. Uh, clover plants actually used to be in lawn mixes before we had pesticides. <laughs> so before World War II, if you were to go out and you were to get a grass seed, it would actually have a certain percentage of clover that was mixed into there because everyone realized that that was really good for the grass. Uh, there's a few other things you can do at extremes, but most, again, most of the times you can get it just through the glass clippings and also through your leaves. So then we go to the P on the NPK, which is phosphorus. Now phosphorus is an issue in Maryland because we do have fertilizer laws that limit how much can go on lawns that are high in phosphorus to protect the bay. Uh, but our grass clippings actually provide way more phosphorus than would actually be allowed from a bag. So grass clippings provide 1.8 pounds of phosphorus per thousand square feet within a year. And our state law limits our inorganic sources to half a pound of phosphorus in that same area. So why not just use the grass and leaves? Uh, so again, leave your grass clippings, chop up leaves, and you've got more phosphorus than you would be allowed to apply from a bag. Uh, compost is an additional source that can be used if your phosphorus is low on your soil test. And you can also increase your endomycorrhizal fungi, which is one of the microorganisms. Those are the ones that actually bind and capture and convert phosphorus from the soil into the form that plants need. And then we have the K. The K is potassium on the NPK. It's also a, a nutrient that grass really needs. We can add and encourage the growth of bacteria and fungi with compost. These uh, are grabbing the potassium and converting it to the form that plants need. Kelp meal and seaweed are good sources of potassium if your potassium is low, and they also supply micronutrients. And then wood ash, which is another free source of uh, materials that we have in our area, can supply potassium and micronutrients. I just tell people to be cautious is that if your pH is already high, uh, wood ash could actually raise the pH in your soil if you're not careful with it. So that's the NPK. Uh, but we can't get the NPK to be converted in, into the form that grass needs unless we have microorganisms. How do we increase the microorganisms in there? We can add compost, which is full of microorganisms. Earthworm castings, which is really just worm poop, um, is fantastic. Uh, highly recommend looking into getting earthworm castings. And also you can add microorganisms by putting down compost tea. Now compost tea is just essentially a, a a garden tea that's been brewed from a healthy batch of compost. And we do have information on our website uh, on how to make compost tea. Uh, you can buy what's called EM, which are effective microorganisms. They come in a liquid form. You put them out typically when it's uh, cooler out, say in the evening or early morning on a rainy day or a cloudy day so that they don't die from the solar radiation, but you can buy those. You can also buy endomycorrhizal fungi to boost your soil populations of fungi. And there's a few other sources out there. Sometimes even just grabbing a handful of healthy uh, garden or forest soil and putting that in as you're spreading out um, other things onto the lawn is really great for bringing microorganisms in there. 
but microorganisms organisms need to eat. They eat a lot of carbon. That is their source of food. So sources of carbon, grass clippings and leaves. Since we're already leaving them on the lawn, fantastic. We've got plenty of food for microorganisms by doing that. You can also add compost, which is a good source of carbon for them to eat. Dried seaweed, if, especially if you're near a coastal area. You can buy that worm castings again, the worm poop. Uh, you can put sawdust or wood chips or newspaper in your compost. Uh, and then I like to recommend straw this time of year. A lot of folks in the fall like to put out hay bales for fall decorations, and then they're not really sure what to do with that hay bale when fall ends. But one of the best things to do is take that hay bale, break it up, spread it over your lawn, run the lawnmower over it, and chop it into small pieces, and your microorganisms will go crazy. It's a fantastic source of food for them. Um, also, calcium. So I mentioned this because I'm gonna mention calcium down in the, when I talk about taking the soil test, but I don't like to use mined materials. So you'll notice that everything that I've presented before, none of it is coming from a, a human made mine. Uh, so if you're looking for sources of calcium that are not mined, you can buy oyster shells, which are crushed and those are a natural source. And again, wood ash is a natural source of calcium. Uh, plants also need micronutrients, not as much as the NPK, but they will not thrive if they don't have other micronutrients. Some of the easiest ways to get that is sea minerals. Sea minerals contain all the elements on the periodic chart, including six, 76 minerals. Uh, wood ash tea can supply a lot of things in there. So this is again, just like making compost tea, but from wood ash to dilute it. Blackstrap molasses can be put into compost tea or wood ash tree, and this has a lot of trace elements and can also boost the soil bacteria. And then compost micronutrients can vary depending what was put in the compost pile, but compost itself will have a lot of micronutrients. Now I'm gonna get into those tips that I said that I was gonna promise you, how to care for a lawn organically. Now that we've gone through all of the soil biology and all of the nutrients, let's talk about the sort of basic easy stuff. Uh, I'm gonna go through these top 10 tips and I'll summarize a couple of them at the end. I, I don't think I have each of them as a 10 slide, but I, I might, I think I do. Hey Mary, Let's before see. So, get started on this, um, we have a yeah. question from Cindy W. And you may be getting to this um, with your top 10, but um, she asked about, um, mentions that many of our lawns have bad invasive grasses like stillgrass and nimble well. And when these go to seed, leaving grass clippings on the lawn seems to just spread the bad actors. Um, any thoughts about that? Yeah, that's a great question and, and something that I, that I probably should have mentioned. Some folks that have a lot of weed seeds, uh, if you are struggling with a high population of weed seeds in your lawn and you have a thin lawn, uh, it, it might be worth bagging just when they are in seed um, and bagging that or putting that in your compost um, because you, you can spread the seeds around. But if you have a healthy, dense lawn, hopefully you're going to have less of that. And then um, if there's only a few, it's not a big deal. But there are some folks that are really struggling with things like stillgrass in high populations and their grass is not super dense yet. So yes, I would say... Um, but it's not gonna be on a regular basis. It would just be when they're in seed. Uh, and that's where it comes down to really knowing what plants look like, knowing that they are in seed. Uh, but usually that might just be once or twice when you're mowing. I, I have a tendency to not mow weekly. I tend to be an every other weaker type of mower. Uh, so it might be maybe once or twice that that, that has to happen. Um, and other people, they, they have such small populations of it, they don't worry about that as much. Thank you. Sure. Uh, okay, so tip number one, stop using synthetic chemicals. I think hopefully you got the message from that by my talking about how you can really be messing with the chemistry in the soil if you don't really know what's going on down there. But as I mentioned, synthetic fertilizers will only feed the plant. Many wash off if the plant is not ready to absorb them. Uh, they also have a lot of embodied energy that it took to create them they can actually cause uh, pest problems. So you can attract pests by putting down some of these synthetic nutrients. They can suddenly force a plant to grow at a rate that's too high and too fast and you get this lush, weak vegetation uh, that attracts pests. And they also harm humans, wildlife, pollinators, and, and pets. 
All right, so then number two, tolerate some weeds. And I put weeds in quote because for some people, things are considered weeds and for other, they're not. Uh, but a weed is really just taking up a space in a lawn where nothing else will grow. A really dense lawn can have up to 6,000 blades of grass in a square foot. That's a lot of grass in one square foot. When it's that dense, it's very hard for weeds to find an opportunity to grow. Uh, most people's lawns are way too thin, don't even come close to that, and other plants will take advantage of that space. Uh, but even in a dense lawn, uh, some weeds are great. There's diversity for pollinators. You're reducing the impact from pesticides by allowing them to grow. Species like clover, as I mentioned, benefit the soil. And actually many weeds and lawns are edible to humans and wildlife. So changing your expectations is really important when you start going to organic lawn care. You gotta think differently that this is not a golf course, uh, this is a lawn and a lawn is alive and it's alive with many different things. And I think for some folks, it's again, an adjustment of attitude. Really important, mowing high and sharp. So why do we wanna mow high? We wanna mow high because taller grass will shade out weeds. It will capture more sun to turn it into energy and make deeper roots. They'll transpire less water by keeping the ground cool. So when a grass is cut really short, uh, it'll get more solar radiation to the soil down below. And when you have all that solar radiation, the grass is stressed, it's gonna evaporate more water, uh, it's gonna be very troublesome, and it's also going to allow weeds to grow more often. So keep your grass at least four to, three to four inches high, raise your mower as high as possible, or tell the person that cuts your lawn to raise it as high as possible. And then we want really sharp blades. So uh, usually when I'm in a room, I ask people how often they sharpen their blades and most people don't even raise their hands. They haven't sharpened them in years. Uh, lawn, lawnmower blades should be sharpened about every 10 to 12 hours of use. Uh, usually for some folks that can be extended a little bit longer, but if you have a lot of things in your lawn like um, sticks or pine cones or things like that, your, your blades will dull faster. But we, we can tell that a blade needs to be sharpened if the end of the grass looks a little bit frayed after you've cut it. So if you start seeing the fraying, it's time to get those blades sharpened. When you have a sharp cut, that lawn will heal faster. Uh, it won't take energy to heal because it's gonna have a nice clean cut. When it's frayed at the end, uh, it takes more energy to heal. It's more of a surface area to evaporate water from, and it's more of a surface area for diseases to attack as well. So in a nice clean cut, I recommend to people to have two blades on hand. So you've got one blade on your mower. When that one gets dull, you take it off, you put the sharp one on. When that one's dull, you can take them both to get sharpened at the same time and save yourself a trip. All right, then I mentioned before leaving all grass clippings. I apologize, there's some motorcycles going by, so a little bit of background noise. Um, so leave all your grass clippings. As I mentioned, they return 50 to 100% of the nitrogen needed on a lawn. They're a major source of carbon-based food for microorganisms and also a carbon sink to get carbon back in the soil. And then you wanna chop up and mulch in as many leaves as possible. Taking a soil sample, I've got a couple slides on this. Taking a soil sample is really important. It measures the levels of nutrients, it measures the organic content, and makes sure that we're following phosphorus laws in uh, Maryland, and it can also help diagnose pest problems. Typically, an annual soil test is gonna help tell you what's going on, or if you have a pest problem, that will help. They cost about eight to 10 bucks, so they're not particularly expensive. If you have different areas of lawn, you wanna take different soil tests. So let's say you have like a shady sloped area and a sunny flat area. You wanna take a different soil test for each of those areas because they're gonna have different soils and different needs. Uh, we've got information on our website about uh, where you can take a, get your soil test from. They typically come with directions on how to take the soil test. They return the results pretty quickly, usually by email. Uh, on your soil test, you want to use a soil testing lab that's mentioned on our website that me measures phosphorus in ranges that explain whether it's high or lower Maryland. 
or low for Maryland. So we've got phosphorus laws that protect the Chesapeake Bay. There are state laws, um, and we want to make sure that we're in the range. When you look at this soil test right here, you can see the phosphorus is the second bar there. And there you can see that it's in the low to medium range, which means that you're allowed to add things like compost and phosphorus to it. If it's in the high to optimum or excessive, you won't be allowed to add things like compost and other sources of phosphorus. You also want to see on this that little yellow box that I highlighted there, and that's measuring the organic matter. So most standard soil tests will tell you your organic matter, and ideally we're looking for organic matter that is over 5%. Uh, this one actually looks pretty good on organic matter because it's right around 5 it's doing pretty well. Then on the soil test, we want to look at calcium to magnesium ratios. I highlighted it here. You can see the calcium 65, magnesium 20. So we're looking for something that is five to eight parts calcium, which is about 60 to 85% on that chart, and one part magnesium, 10 to 13%. So you can see here that my magnesium is really high. It's well over that 10 to 13%, and it's the five to one is a little bit off. We also want, when we add those two numbers, the calcium and magnesium, we want them to be under 80% of the total CEC. So I said the CEC is the cation exchange capacity. When this is taking up more than 80%, it means there's not a lot of room for other nutrients to be bound to the soil. So here I've got 85% of the soil is taken up by calcium and magnesium stuck to the soil, and that's only leaving me 15% to get other nutrients on there. So we wanna be able to bring that a little bit down. That's why I mentioned earlier sources of calcium. This uh, magnesium source was really high and we wanna boost the calcium a little bit. And that's where things like the oyster shell, um, also things like eggshells in your compost and things like that, anything shell-based uh, and also wood ash can help with that. All right, number six, uh, chorate compacted soils. So if you were to go out and it hasn't rained in a couple days, uh, if you were to go out with a, a screwdriver and push it into your soil and it's relatively hard to push it in, that means that your soil is very compacted. Now, sometimes that's coming from your soil test. The last soil test that I just showed you had a really high magnesium, which can make the soil more compacted. Uh, but also our soils around here, especially in developed areas, can be pretty high in clay and very low in organic matter. So when we core aerate, what that does is it opens up these plugs in the soil. It, it allows air in for microorganisms and water to penetrate the soil. It opens up areas when we're putting compost down for the compost to mix into the soil profile. It allows us to have areas where the uh, seeds will fall in with the compost when we're overseeding. You can see a picture here. Core aeration essentially pulls out plugs from the soil that just look like grass poop. A lot of times uh, folks need to rely on professionals to do this because the machines can be awfully heavy, uh, but there are some smaller machines that you can do this yourself or to get together with a bunch of neighbors uh, on renting one, but you'll need usually a trailer or things like that or have it dropped off. So usually professionals will do this. They need to run over your lawn at least two, three, maybe four times back and forth, not just once across the soil. You wanna pull a lot of these plugs out. Uh, they, again, they're about the size of goose poop and within a day or two, they'll break down and disappear. You wouldn't even know that you did it. Number seven is overseeding the lawn. This is very important. A lot of people have never overseeded their lawns. Uh, some folks don't need it. I actually lived at a rental property once that was the lawn was just thick and lush and it never needed overseeding. It, it grew like crazy. I have, I have no way to explain how it stayed so dense. Uh, but usually annually, you should be overseeding the lawn. Now you folks are getting this presentation at the perfect time of year because this is when you should be overseeding. You want to overseed um, now, essentially in the next couple of weeks. So overseeding goes great with aeration if you can do the two together. Uh, but overseeding is going to rejuvenate lawns. So I mentioned that lawns can have up to 6,000 blades of grass per square feet. Most of the lawns that we grow around here, particularly the fescue lawns, they don't spread. And those individual grass plants live on average eight years or less. So as they're dying, we need to rejuvenate them. And we also cannot prevent weeds if we don't have a dense lawn. So overseeding is really, really important. Uh, fall is the best time to do it. The second best time to do it is in the winter, uh, what we call a dormant overseeding, and we've got a blog about that on our website. Um, 
the third best time is spring and then the least best time is over the summer but you may may be able to spot seed especially when you had weedy patches or a dead patch or something it's just going to require a lot more water to get it to grow in the summer uh, before you go on um, mary could you um just uh quick question yeah um, in terms of uh, the order in which you aerate and seed because someone mentioned um Aren't there a lot of seeds in the aerated plugs? So a lot of times when folks aerate, they'll also put their compost and seed out at the same time uh, because then they so it also falls into those holes, which is actually good for the for the seeds. It helps um, it helps reduce bird predation on the seeds and it also gets it into the soil profile where it can germinate and grow. Oh, cool. Thanks. But you can you can aerate any time, but typically people will combine it with an overseeding. Okay, uh, number eight, add carbon-based material. So I mentioned earlier about carbon being the major source of food for microorganisms. It also buffers the pH, increases the cation exchange capacity for nutrients, increases the carbon for feeding our micronutrients or microorganisms, supplies micronutrients, feeds our microorganisms, and fights disease diseases as well. Uh, so if you have a really large area, you may wish to try compost tea. It's cheaper, there's no phosphorus concerns with compost tea, and it's certainly less labor intensive than trying to spread compost over a very large area. Number nine, limit watering. So we only want to water during establishment or major drought. When you do have to water, because you're either establishing new seed or because of a drought, you want to water deeply. So this is an inch or more at a time. How do you know that you had an inch or more? You can put out a bowl and as you're watering, you'll be able to check if the bowl fills up with an inch, you've gotten that. When we do frequent shallow watering, we can actually encourage weeds and discourage grass roots from growing deeper. Uh, so don't don't be frequently out there with the hose or the sprinklers or things like that. Again, only, only water during establishment or drought. Many of our lawns really kind of need a little bit of rest. There's no use forcing them to grow when they actually need to go dormant. So I, I talk, mostly I'm talking about fescue lawns that go dormant in the summer. Let them go a little bit dormant, let them get a little brown, they're not gonna die on you. And last but not least, consult with a professional. So not all are alike. Uh, very, there's fewer professionals these days that have good organic knowledge, but more and more are out there. So check with the experts around you about what to do, but also be a source of wisdom yourself. Go to our website. Um, there's some more books on organic lawn care. Become an expert so that also if you're talking with a professional, you can tell them what you need and um, have an, an uh, you know, a smart dialogue with them about it. Also use reputable suppliers, seek local experts, don't rely just on the internet. And of course, always above all, demand quality. Uh, you don't have to have uh, shortcuts done on your lawn. Uh, this will be my last slide before I put up my email. But again, these are the top tips. We went over all of these things. Stop using synthetic pesticides and fertilizers, tolerate some weeds and change your expectations. Mow your grass high with sharp blades. Leave your grass clippings and chop up leaves. Take a soil sample. Core aerate if your soil is compacted. Overseed regularly. Add your carbon-based amendments so you feed the soil, not the plant. Stop frequent shallow watering and consult with professional. Uh, so here, oh, that sorry, that's not, I'll put it in the chat. This is a general email inbox. I forgot to put my own but um, mine is mary.travellini, which I'll put in the chat box at montgomerycountymd.gov, although you can also use this Ask DEP email. And then our website is there, which is montgomerycountymd.gov slash lawns. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing so I can put that in the chat box and answer any questions. Um, so Mary, before we start um, just taking them from the audience, there were, there were several people who were asking more about um, uh, tenacious weeds, I guess, um, particularly nimble will, white clover, um, and what to do when you have a thick lawn, but those are still taking over. So that was one question. And then the other one was about what your thoughts are on um, special grasses like zoysia or Canada green. 
So I'll throw those out uh, as people think about other questions. Sure, uh, so tenacious weeds. Uh, the reason they they are tenacious is because they're taking advantage of the situation they have. Typically weeds, again, they're just filling a niche where the grass is not there. But the grass might not be there because the soil conditions might be terrible. So I can't speak to every everyone's individual situation might be different. Because if you then said to me, oh, well, it's a really shady area, it's under a tree, or we recently did construction back there, or um, or this, we took a soil test and such and such is off. So there can be many different reasons, but again, they're occupying a niche where grass is not growing. And they might, you might have a very large seed bank. It might take several years, uh, but you, the goal again is to try to get the grass as dense as possible. Some of that might require some hand weeding and some patch seeding, sort of like year round patch seeding. Uh, you might be working with nutrient balances, you know, getting your organic matter up, getting your nutrients up, getting that soil to be alive again. Uh, so again, everyone's scenario is gonna be a little bit different, but I think the general guidance that I gave there, it's, it's kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's more tips and things on our website as well. Uh, but all of those tips, you know, there's something behind it as to why one person's situation might be different than another. So I wish I had a miracle answer to it, but it's going to take it's going to take work on focusing on getting the densest lawn possible. Even organic lawn care experts uh, that have really like a heavy focus, they're still going to have some weeds in lawns. You know, you can have the best fescue organic lawn possible and still have a little bit of Bermuda grass, still have a dandelion pop up, and you're going to have to go after those things uh, and you know patch in those areas. Um, Another thing to keep in mind is that if your lawn is really more weed than it is grass and you want grass to go, grow there, you may have to start from scratch. Uh, some folks who have a lot of stilt grass, for example, like a lot of stilt grass, and they really wanna get a good grass established, they sometimes smother their lawns completely. So they take that heavy contractor plastic, they put it down, they smother it completely so they can kill the plants and the, the weed the seeds that are in the soil, and then they start from scratch with a full reseeding of that area. So again, everyone's scenario is gonna be a little bit different. I, I wish I had a, a bullet, a perfect bullet answer for you. So what are your thoughts about um, special grasses? Do they, oh, yeah. Other grasses, other grasses are great. I think, uh, you know, some of them are better in sun, some are better in shade. Some people love zoysia. It requires less mowing. It's, it can be a little bit more of an investment up front to establish, uh, but, but folks love zoysia grass. Um, Bermuda grass around here, some people love having a Bermuda grass lawn. It's a tenacious weed in, in garden beds, but it makes for a fantastic lawn. I'm not, I'm not an expert on all the different types of lawn grasses out there and, and that's where professionals come in a little bit more that have more experience with the different types. Uh, but yeah, sun, shade, slopes, et cetera. I, you know, as long as, as long as it's a grass that grows around here, uh, folks can use them. All right, um, Althea uh, asked if you were familiar with, whoops, the documentary that Woody Harrelson put out um, and what you thought about the information uh, they gave on soil biology. Which, which documentary? Uh, it's called Kiss the Ground by Woody oh. Harrelson. Oh, I haven't actually seen it, so I guess I'll have to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. We have another question about, um, you're mentioning the oyster shells for calcium. Uh, what are your thoughts about eggshells? Yeah, eggshells are great too. I mean, some people will put them in their compost. Uh, some people will actually use like an old blender that you don't mind beating the blades up. They're really hard to, to crush up uh, and they take a long time to break down in, comp in some compost. Uh, but yeah, eggshells are also a great source of calcium and we've got a lot of them. So if you, if you compost, I highly recommend putting them in the compost. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think people are still are feeling uh, there's still, still some questions about a larger lawn um, and how you deal with these invasive weeds um, when you have a half acre or more. 
Yeah, so good question. And again, everyone's scenario is different. Sometimes I tell people, if it's too much for you, get rid of some lawn. Um, I grew up in a semi-rural area that had a lot of lawn that we kind of don't do anything except mow. And over the years, still grass has gotten a lot worse um, and uh, some other things grow in there, but also it's got an amazing amount of spring beauties and other things that, that are native and fantastic. So it's more of a wild lawn. I think for some folks that want a really pristine lawn because of where they live, some of it's changed. Again, I can't, I can't force anyone, but changing expectations if you don't have the ability to care for it uh, organically. You know, I mean, sorry, if you don't have the ability to care for it without just taking something from a bag. Because I'll be honest, it's, it's no different than having a small garden versus a large garden. It amounts to more maintenance. If you've got a large vegetable garden, it's more work than a small vegetable garden. If you've got a large lawn, it's more work than a small lawn. All of these tips apply to small to large lawns, uh, and um, that you know it's. I'm not. I, I would never tell somebody it's easy. Don't worry about it. It's easy. It's not easy. It's not easy for somebody with a small lawn. Uh, who who also doesn't maybe have the time or resources, there might be a reason somebody lives somewhere with a small lawn on, versus why somebody lives somewhere with a large lawn, but they all apply to large lawns. And ultimately doing things like overseeding. So one of the things we say is overseed instead of weed and feed, right? So a lot of people put down a weed and feed, but you could take the time, the money, uh, and the labor out of the weed and feed and just put it into overseeding. It costs about the same. It's just a different time of year that you're doing something. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Bruce Moran has um, asked again um, about, you know, now what do you do when your neighbor's lawns are weed infested? Um, how do you attack this problem? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you know, I, I get I get those questions I get those questions a lot too of well I'm doing my part but my neighbor isn't doing isn't doing their part or they're you know I've been trying to do this and that if your neighbor's lawn is very weedy and your lawn is healthy and dense and doesn't have the area for seeds to touch the ground have soil sun, uh, sunlight water nutrients because your lawn is really dense it's going to help prevent those weed seeds from getting established in your lawn. Uh, but you're unfortunately in a slight, your labor might be a little bit higher than someone else's simply because you back up to a forest or you have a neighbor with a weedy lawn. Um, it's, I, I, I hate to be the person that shrugs her shoulders and say, well, that's nature, uh, but it is, it is nature. That's how it works. You know, if you live close to a forest, you might have more forest weeds. If you live next to somebody that has a lot of dandelions, you're going to have more dandelions blowing on your lawn. But we also have wildlife. It, you know, we, these things are not just spreading from your neighbor's lawn. They're also coming from birds dropping seeds and pooping seeds out. They're coming from rabbits. They're coming from deer. So all of these things are constantly moving. And the best you can do is try to do your part and spread that education to your neighbor who spreads it to their neighbor and so on. Um, uh, we had another question about from Althea um, about whether or not your agency has tips on what to look for regarding landscapers. For instance, um, and and she's looking forward to getting uh, more into your website uh, for ideas and information. I'm sorry. I guess I missed. I'm, can you say that one again? Or wait, I sure, can see it here. Sure. I'll say oh, regarding landscapers. Yeah. Actually, yes, we do. On our website, we have something that's that's what to ask your, you know, essentially what to ask your landscaper. Uh, and some of it is to tell them also, like to you know, ask them their education and ask about it. But we actually do have something on our website about seeking out professionals who can help with organic uh, landscaping. Mm -hmm. 